What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview every single week. I interview top real estate professionals, top entrepreneurs, and straight up top badasses that are out there dominating their spaces or people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, guys, I got another rock star guest here on the show. Our guest today, Jen Schiff, is one of the top team leaders in the whole entire nation. Uh, and today, guys, she breaks down how she built this extremely successful business, how her and her husband, Michael, built this extremely successful business. As well, she goes really deep into how to thrive as a virtual real estate professional, breaking down how to do virtual effective showings, effective virtual tours, how to hold your virtual uh, team meetings with your staff, with your agents, holding people accountably, uh, accountable virtually, um, how to do effective virtual community block parties that are getting massive results and so much more. Real quick though, before we jump into this amazing podcast interview, if you are a real estate professional, if you're a real estate agent, team leader, brokerage owner, and you are looking to expand your real estate business, looking to take it to the next level, and are interested in my personal coaching and mentorship program, make sure to check out MasteryBootCamp.com, where you can check more information about the program, you can learn more about it, you can see testimonials and the successes that thousands and thousands of agents that have been through this program have uh, been able to create for themselves and their families, and you you can also book a 100% pressure-free discovery call where you can get all your questions answered to see if this program is a fit for you. So again, masterybootcamp.com. All right, you guys, I will see you inside this epic podcast with Jen Schiff. All right, Jen, I'm so excited, stoked, and honored to have you here on the podcast with us today. I'm honored myself. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, this honor's all mine, and, and you're a real estate agent, team leader, and, and as well as an entrepreneur in, in many different ventures. And, uh, you know, you've, you've been able to create tremendous amount of success. And, you know, before we get into all the great stuff that you're doing now today, I'm always intrigued first in our guest journeys that let them here in the first place, you know? So if you were on the clocks, like how, how did this real estate journey start for you in the first place? Mm. Um, the real estate journey started for me initially in 2010. Um, at that time, my husband had been in the industry for multiple years and was really banging his head against the wall, trying to figure out a way to go from like agent to business. And I was actually very resistant about it for a long time. And it was a Keller Williams family reunion for those of us who may be familiar with that and being invited to that event and learning that real estate could be treated as a business model and that it wasn't just about being a real estate agent. It was about having a thriving business if you could commit to the actions necessary to succeed. And when I saw that it was duplicatable and I saw that through execution, we could get generate incredible results. I was all in and just ready to build. Love it. So what, what was it before you went to family reunion? Like what, what were the resistance, you know, the, the, like what was the, I guess the doubt or the resistance to jumping in? Yeah. So like three nights a week, um, my husband, then boyfriend, would wake me up like throwing the laptop somewhere because he had just loaded 30 pictures into the MLS and it deleted. <laughs> and it was just like watching the constant um, grind that real estate can be, especially as a single agent. I had not seen any models or examples of real estate as a business. I had only seen a really high functioning real estate agent in the midst of their day to day and always having to be on. It was before DocuSign, hours and hours going to people's houses just to sign contracts. And I'm like, I was working three hours, you know, a day, 165% of goal in a sales job that wasn't real estate. And so I couldn't understand how I would want to work 18 hours a day. Just my own ignorance, I think. I didn't understand it. And so I was really resistant and I wanted the independence of my own income and managing my time different than what I had seen him managing. And so I just didn't understand what was possible. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Um, yeah. And now, and now that you jumped in, I mean, you guys, you guys built a, a, a tremendous team together. I think I, I read that last year, you guys did 200 million in gross volume sales as far as production and, and one of the top teams in the entire country. And, 
Um, you know, I'm curious to, you know, when you first jumped in, I know that boyfriend at the time, but you know, husband now was, was established in the business. But when you jumped in, I mean, we know the failure rate and the struggles that real estate agents have. I mean, 90% drop out in the first three years. And of those that make it, you know, a lot of real estate agents just kind of repeat the same shitty year, 30 years in a row, you know, right. They never grow and expand. And you know, what were those, uh, some of the things that you did initially, after family reunion, once you jumped in, that really started to accelerate the growth because you guys have had some huge growth in the what nine years that it's been now. Yeah, and uh, just to I like to keep the evidence to my numbers. We weren't two hundred million last year. Um, we've gone between fifty and seventy-five million as individual teams, and when we were part of Five Doors, and I had the honor to lead that as VP of Ops, um, we were at about three hundred fifty million. So, depending whether we were in expansion or out of expansion, okay, um, yep. I just want to correct that number because I don't want to say do anything I don't do yet. That's the way it's set up just because we were in there. Um, but going back to just the beginning and how we grew the business, um, we grew at about 60, 650% in four years from about a $12 million business um, at the peak to a $75 million business. And I always make the joke that I would pay a Harvard tuition every year on KW education. And that is really the sole way that we grew the business our hard work and everything that went with that, of course, but it was really just learning what others had proven before and then executing on what they had done first and getting a result and then brought a little bit of our own creativity after we had seen something work. So we really understood that the key component to growing business is not to start at your creativity, start at those who have walked before you. And when you can prove and you can show a result of those who can walk before you, then you almost give yourself the grace and honor in your business to be able to then try something different that could be that thing that creates that scale or creates that spike. Um, yet it was really critical that for myself in growing the business and learning real estate at the same time that I could at least duplicate what somebody had done before us. Yeah, love it. So powerful. So then you know, from afar, when you see the growth that you've had, you know, it always, it, it, it is tremendous and it's amazing, you know, right? But it, it's like, look, behind the scenes, people don't see the struggles and the adversity that you had to overcome, you know? And I'm, I'm you know, curious of, you know, I've yet to meet a top producer that didn't have to push their own personal shit storms, if you will. And I mean, what, what are, I guess, your best practices or, or what do you do during, you know, a, a really bad time or when you're, when you are failing to keep pushing through so you can break through to that success? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, you know, it depends how severe the failure may be. Um, however, regardless, I think it begins with a mindset that you have to hold on to at all times, good, bad, or indifferent. And so if you're in a certain mindset of a um, idea that in order for you to succeed, you actually will have to fail, fail often and fail hard, that as the failures come, you immediately go straight into what are the lessons that I need to preserve? What didn't work for me here? Where were my intentions? And how do I take different actions again in giving it another whirl? And I think when you really look at failure in a mindset of like not allowing the emotions of the failure to stop you and just acknowledging and isolating that you are having a moment in which something you intended to work didn't and now you know what not to do next time. Um, I think that's a huge part of what has allowed my speed of growth to happen in all of our businesses is, you know, remove the emotion. Um, I always teach don't act on feelings. If we act on our feelings, we're never going to get anywhere. You have to act to what you know is the next logical step and acknowledge and honor the feelings, but don't let them cause you to not take action when you know better because you learned the failure. Yeah. Love it. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, so true that really growth comes through pain and suffering, you know, right. It's like you're experiencing happiness or you're experiencing, experiencing growth. And when you have that mindset, it's really not a failure. It's just another growth opportunity. And that allows, whether it's called entrepreneurship or just life to really be that teacher. And would you say a huge part of that though, was also always aligning yourself with mentors? 
Um, I would say that having mentors have always been a huge impact in my life personally. Um, my brain really thrives off of collaboration. Um, so just having people in my life that I could hear give me a perspective that maybe I hadn't seen yet, or again, I just love people who have walked before me, and to be able to learn the lessons that they learned uh, definitely helped keep me focused that in the moments in where I may not be winning, uh, you can either win or learn, you don't lose. And just watching that other people have done that and borrow their belief sometimes in me has been a huge aspect in being able to continue that growth. Yeah, love it. So then, I mean, you're also somebody that operates, I mean, you're very proactive and you also operate with speed as far as your execution. And I know we were talking off air uh, before we hit the record button, but right now, at least as the time that we're recording this, we're kind of in the, the middle of the coronavirus pandemic and we're all having to reinvent our businesses and pivot and you've been just absolutely crushing it with being able to adapt very quickly and having success you know with with that virtual component and before you know we get into the virtual component or or the thing the things that you've done to adapt i'm really curious going back to more of the mindset stuff because you know a lot of people it's so easy to operate in a place of fear in a time like now you know right you go on media you know watch the media you watch social media it's like the sky is falling it's tough to not know what's going on and it's hard to be able to think clearly to see the opportunities at hand for, for so many. And what are things that you do specifically like during this time to kind of maybe block out the noise, quiet your mind to be able to see the opportunities and the shifts that you need to make? Yes, another excellent question. Um, well, the first thing is, is that I have made the personal choice to not watch the news. Um, I will get updates of what's going on and what's important, but I do not plug into anything that I feel like could affect the mindset I'm working to build. I think that that's a really big thing that we can learn in life in general, not only in the situation. Um, your mind has the opportunity to have a bunker and what you choose to allow into that bunker um, is ultimately up to you. And so I avoid stimulus that I feel is going to bring me into a negative or emotional state. Um, and through that process, I always choose gratitude and I choose to do what I can with what's available today. And I know that fear gets created in the anxiety of the future. And no matter how much time we spend obsessing over what the future is going to look like, my favorite question right now is, Jen, when do you think this is going to end? Yeah. <laughs> and my favorite answer is I'm not even spending a second thinking about it. When I hear, when I get the call that somebody tells me I can leave my house, I'll be ready. And, you know, I think that naturally we want to spend time in speculation and, you know, there's such great effect and impact um, to us negatively and just the change like that in itself, the fears of the unknown. Yet, if you can just hunker into the now and control what is controllable today, that has been one of the greatest differentiators that I've been able to lead my team and my consulting clients through where we're getting results and others just aren't doing anything. Yeah, love it, love it. So that allows you to then to focus on the now, focus on the moment, stay in action, not operate in fear. Um, but then from there, you know, because we are having to, in this quarantine state, we're all having to, well, at least those that choose to be, that are choosing to be proactive and not bury their head in the sand are having to shift very quickly to a lot of, of virtual meetings, virtual presentations and so forth. You know, what are, what are some of the things that you guys have shifted to that that's working really well right now currently? Yeah, this, I, I get excited. I get passionate. <laughs> um, you know, so one of the things in leading high energy teams virtually that we've experienced and had a ton of success with is the mindset of treating it just as if you are getting ready to have a party in your office every single day, right? You know, people think that just because we're getting on video or just because we're not physically together, that that is an excuse to show up inappropriately, not dressed, hair not brushed, laying back, Cheetos on our face right? What it really means is that when we're on video, we want to present ourselves even better than we typically would if we were going into the office or having a meeting. And it takes more than two times the energy on video for you to feel what somebody is attempting to create versus when you're in person. And so using different tools and techniques in our virtual meetings to drive the energy has been a game changer for us. Um, some of the things that we do is just starting our meetings with music 
right? Everybody comes on and there's music playing to create the energy of what we want to experience with each other for that day. Um, we do meetings twice a day. We're on Zoom two hours a day and we're making sure that we're just providing like relevant high energy tactics to everybody and ways to have conversation and practice conversations. Um, some of the things that have been really helpful for us, just giving back to the community, because that's what's most important given the situation in general. Um, we've launched a community page that's already almost 1,500 members in just about a week that's gotten a ton of attention. And we've used the community page to just drive virtual collaboration and virtual connectivity. And what that does is it gives our team the opportunity to just have really empowering, exciting things to talk about, not only with who they're reaching out to, but internally within the organization. So we may have to be home, but it doesn't mean that we still can't feel each other's energy. We still can't have a good time. It doesn't mean that you don't have permission to laugh because you're in quarantine. And so ways that we're creating either virtual happy hours, uh, we did a virtual block party, um, all sorts of different things things to just keep driving people together and keep our thoughts on what we can control and create high energy and happiness to the extent it's possible by just living in the moment and doing these types of events. Love it. So when you're doing these virtual happy hours or virtual communities, you know, <clears throat> I've, I've talked to a lot of real estate agents that have, have had the had the idea whether it's from somebody else or so forth but you know sometimes it's tough to be creative to think about you know how, how do we conduct these what do we talk about you know right because if i go out there and do a virtual happy hour to people in the community you know potential buyers sellers so forth you know right like we don't want to bombard them when make this like a sales deal you know right um uh per se you know right but what, what are some of the things that have been working with those that seem to get the most engagement and the most appreciation from, you know, from your communities? Yeah, I love that you asked that question. Thank you. Um, so I would say that professionally, um, from a real estate standpoint, and we did like a realtor happy hour and things like that, um, what really works is there's something in Zoom, if you have a Zoom paid account called Zoom breakout rooms, um, through Zoom breakout rooms, it gives you the ability to break large groups into smaller uh, conversations. And depending on how many people are, are in the group or how many people you want in the room, you can really control all the aspects of it. So we found that as a community, as a real estate community, either how we're connecting with each other or how we're connecting in our team, um, the breakout rooms are a phenomenal way to be able to drive smaller conversations, do script practices, objection handling, getting feedback. Um, and we've also used it for games. So we'll break people out and we'll have fun games and feed questions in and do trivias and things like that. So again, utilizing the technology and the tool we have to still give people what they crave the most right now and it's human connection. And sometimes the more intimate that human connection is, the more powerful it is for the people that are experiencing it. So that's yeah. a tool with, within a tool that people are already using um, that's been really helpful. And on the just community page of creating like our happy hour block party, um, you know, we bring, bring live music. So we have live guitar players that open up and play music as people are coming in. Um, we set up and share our screen. So there's like a big welcome statement and a quote and grab a drinky and a snacky and we can't wait to like cheers with you. So as people are coming in, they already have an experience. So I think with these Zooms, just like creating these virtual events, um, it's just like a party. So when you have a party, you want people to walk into music and you want people to have drinks and food and you want them to be able to have conversation and you want them to have some sort of entertainment. So I've just brought the same thing we did with parties virtually. And so we did virtual, like the guitar player, um, we had karaoke, we use breakout rooms to play quiplash um, we do emoji competitions where we do like emoji, guess the songs, gets the movies, win gift cards, anything that you can use to engage. Um, and the chat feature in Zoom as well is asking people questions, getting them talking. I always ask for spirit hands when I'm in there just to see people move and create the energy. Um, all of those things are just creating really cool results. Yep, love it. Powerful stuff. So then, you know, because there's, there's the other flip side to it of you know, getting homes sold and, and working with buyers and sellers and, you know, 
whether that may be a, a listing presentation virtually for people that don't feel comfortable meeting with us in person or you know, I'm, I'm hearing a, a lot of agents doing FaceTime showings and, and so forth. You know, are those also tools that you've implemented when it comes to working with your buyers and sellers? Yes. So we actually have on um, the transactional side of the business, we have launched full tele real estate buyer and seller programs. So we are completely virtual on both sides. Um, we have sold, put well, we put them under contract sight unseen using our virtual programs. Um, and we've helped be able to pen properties, even if the buyers are still seeing it, maybe at the end, if it's a vacant property, we are still very much using our virtual techniques to be able to drive people through the transaction. A um, bunch of stuff I could share on that as well. I would say uh, one of the things that's made the biggest difference is as a community um, and our real estate agents, we're calling and we're telling people like, how are you? And we're letting them know that we have virtual systems and tools available. But when you say things, people hear it. And now in this case, when they see it, they believe it. It's not when they say it, they believe it. And so people need to see what virtual really is. And so there's been more than a handful of people that I've had in pipelines that told our agents or told my consulting clients that they wanted to pause because they didn't really understand what was possible for them. And through going through the process of just advertising in the way of putting your stuff on social media, you know, putting our newsletters out, showing people what a virtual transaction looks like and what the virtual tours look like and how our Matterport looks. We have flipped many people who have come back to us and said, hey, I didn't realize that this is what it would look like if I still sold my house. I see what you're doing on 123 Main Street. Like, I still want to go active. Or the buyer who said, hey, I didn't realize that I could see the house this clearly through these Matterports. If you're willing to go and do a virtual tour of the closet that I can't see, I, I'd be willing to put in an offer. Yep. And so I think, again, we put up barriers. That's life. You know, we're resisting machines that put up barriers. And so now more than ever, we're just setting all these expectations of what we think people are thinking and how they're going to act versus delivering them what we know will work and staying in the actions of how that's possible. And by proving that, when people see that proof, then they're willing to be able to move forward. Um, you know, we put six deals under contract last week. Yep, that's awesome. I love it. And, it, and it's, you know, one thing that you said there too, being able to show them is so powerful, you know, right? If they're kind of a, a, a little cynical, which especially during these times, I understand why people would be, you know, cynical and skeptical, you know, right? But when you can shoot them over an email with Matterport examples and so forth, you know, I can, I can see the power in that. Um, you know, question on Matterport, you know, I've, I've, I've personally, we've always kind of been on the fence with that system up until these times, you know, right. Cause it was, it was like, look, it, was, it seemed like a cool feature that might help a seller make that decision to list with you, you know, right. But I yet to, again, prior to this quarantine, I heard of a home actually selling from somebody just seeing, that, but now times are totally different. And was this something that you were doing before the, this, this pandemic crisis, however you want to frame it, happened? Um, and if so, what, what have you seen the differences in the results between like pre this compared to the power that it seems to be bringing now? Yeah. Um, yes, we did do it prior. We actually um, have the first version Matterport camera. So we've owned it since it first came out that first year. And we used it as a listing tool to help just differentiate our listing from other listings in the market more than anything. Um, I think the thing that is most significant about the changes in how real estate professionals need to um, show the homes is previously, whether it was Matterport or whether it was a virtual tour, the idea of real estate marketing is always that we are doing everything we can to bring the buyer into the home. Right. We want to showcase the home in the most positive light through those videos and tours that gets them to want to see it and want to purchase it. Well, we're not in that world anymore. Now we're in a world in which we're trying to attempt to get a buyer to purchase and maybe make the biggest purchase of their entire life, potentially sight unseen. And so in order for us to be able to do that, you know, we have to correlate back to what other industries do a really great job of being able to sell a product like that. And cars are the best thing that come to mind because how do you buy a used car online? You don't see the car 10 feet away in the lot and say you want to buy it. You see the picture of every scratch, dent, mark in the leather and every imperfection that the car has. 
So now video tours and the way that we need to be able to show buyers and sellers how we're able to sell the homes is actually through the imperfections of the home even more so than it is the things that are going to help sell the features and benefits because by giving transparent vision to the buyers of all of those elements, they can start to feel comfortable in making decisions knowing that they're seeing everything. And that's a big part of how we've adapted, especially our virtual tours. The Matterports are access to liking the home and whether it's the seller or the agent who's doing virtual tours, it's the virtual tour that's going into every nook and cranny and showing them the scratches, dents and bumps of the house. And that's what's working. So with that, because it sounds like what, what you're meaning there is like, uh, uh, at least in my, my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, but authenticity of, of the true home, you know, right? Like we can go get these photos and then you get in the home and it's like, ah, it doesn't quite look like the photos on the MLS and so forth. You know, right? So then when you're creating that, maybe the second round of video, once they're enticed that you're sending them, is this more of kind of like just a, a raw, like either with a GoPro or your cell phone where they're, you know, they know it's not photoshopped. Yes. And, you know, of course, if you want to be what I like to call a certified virtual real estate professional, you likely want to have a stabilizer. Uh, you may want to have a little bit of familiarity with a video editing software in case you drop the camera so you don't have to start over. Um, you know, in my um, Thrive as a Virtual Real Estate Professional Facebook group, I have a lot of these tools and tips inside there. Yet short answer is it is the homemade version. It is the way in which you should still prepare to walk through the home. Um, you want to have the doors open, the cupboards open, everything in advance. You want to make sure that all CDC protocol, especially today, is being followed. And yet, as you tour the home, you don't want to tour the home in a way that, you know, it's almost water skiing or scuba diving. So we used to water ski the home in video to get people into what we want to see. And now we have to scuba dive into the home and show them the deepest depths of that ocean so that they can truly make those decisions. Um, one of the other fun tips that is helpful for people, whether you want to put it in the listing or whether you want to make sure that this is a part of that secondary virtual tour is showing the systems. You know, people don't show systems when they list properties, sometimes investors, but very rarely. And in order again to be able to start thinking how do people make sight unseen buying decisions, because this has happened very much historically, not in traditional real estate, but especially in the investment space. Um, people need to be able to see systems and they need to know the age and the condition of them. So make sure that whether you choose to put in the listing or whether you choose to showcase it in those further conversations, that that's a key component to help your buyers make those decisions without seeing it. Yeah, love it. Well, and I got to imagine that if you, if you have these, are you pre doing these on every property? Um, we're not pre doing the virtual tours yet. Um, we have the Matterports on every single one, and we're doing a round of virtual open houses this weekend that we intend to keep that tour as this. Um, so you can only move so fast, but yes, it will yeah. all be tied together. Yeah, because like with my team, I mean, we're doing, we're doing the second round of virtual tours, if you will, but it's, you know, a lot of, it's, fa it's all through FaceTime, but we're physically going through each home and showing it, which you know, creates, of course, a lot of extra added work, you know, right? But so I could see how, yeah, if you had that available where you could send it as that second round, um, you know, being the power of it. And is there, because it sounds like you're waiting to send the second video, maybe once you have those fully ready until they kind of raise their hand with interest of the first one. Is there, you know, rhyme to the reason with that versus just having them both available on, on like your website or so forth? No, I think that's just speed of execution, probably, yeah. if I was saying anything. It's, you know, the first thing was making sure that every listing had a Matterport on it. Um, and then we've been, we're in the market where you have to sell your listings again, right? Like, so remember in the last shift, what did you have to do to sell your listings? You had to contact the agent that was going to show it every single time and make them your best friend. You'd have to call them after and make sure they loved everything. And you probably needed to have an incentive on your property that was going to move it to we're very much in those times as well. So we wanna think about how we are treating the homes in a way that we are 
selling them truly. They're not necessarily going to sell themselves. So having the virtual tour there in place, I think is helpful. Um, we found that people have had specific questions of things they've wanted to see as that second layer. And so we've done the virtual tours that way. Yet I would 100% agree that if you can have a Matterport and a evergreen virtual tour in place for every home, that's just going to be a bigger differentiator for you and how people are viewing listings right now. Um, I can guarantee people one thing, if you are continuing to list properties and you're not using any type of virtual video or Matterport or 3D tour, you're really doing a disservice to yourself and your client right now, because that's what people are searching for first and foremost. Just yeah. like buyers used to search for the houses that had 30 pictures or more, now they're searching by the ones that have video tour and have the Matterports. So you have to get in the mindset of the consumers right now, not in the mindset of how us as real estate agents want to do things. Yeah, love it. Such powerful stuff. So then in, in regards to the, the virtual open houses, you know, is this, can you kind of walk us through kind of, I don't know if you've, if this is going to be your first week in doing them or if this is something that you've tested with in the past, but it's a question I get every day, you know, right from podcast listeners and so forth of, you know, what do you recommend I do in a virtual open house? And it, you know, I, I can kind of give them a canned response, but the reality is I haven't done one, you know, right? So I don't know my best practices, what works. And can you kind of walk us through like maybe what the overall concept is? Is it like a legit open house other than just like a Facebook Live or, or kind of what does that look like? Sure. Um, I mean, it's like a recipe. So you could put all sorts of different ingredients and get different results, but I can definitely share a model that I think can work for people. Um, so first and foremost, you want to make sure just like with any open house that you are marketing it. Um, and if you do any type of social ads, adding social ads to that. So you're generating as many eyes to the open house as you possibly can. Um, the open house itself should really be set up as if you were walking a person through the home, just like step by step, every nook and cranny, and you're talking through the entire home and you're talking the features, the benefits, and you're saying, uh oh, there might be a little bump in the wall there, right? You're just making it in a way that people can feel like they're truly walking through the home with you. Um, in order to be able to do it in a way that would show you to be a virtual professional, which I think is important. I know that they say that the video I created is better the video than the video that you don't create. Yet I also believe that there's a little bit of professionalism that helps in your recording and how you're doing things. So if you do have a stabilizer or you do have a way to just set yourself up for success, like make sure you understand your technology before you get started so you're not stumbling once you're live and once you're going through things. Um, and then just like, again, I had mentioned before, like have your doors open ahead of time, have the covers, have the things open and plan how you're going to walk through the home. So when you're doing the open house and you're taking people through and you're talking them through every aspect and feature and benefit, then at that same time, you already know where you're going and what you're doing and you don't have to think about both at the same time and potentially even miss anything. So really plot that. Um, and then the real aspect of it is what you choose to do as far as um, are you going to do a Zoom into a Facebook Live? Are you just gonna go Facebook Live with the open house? Some of the technology pieces, I think, depends on what the capability of the agent and the team supporting them are. Ultimately though, just to keep it simple, you can just go Facebook Live and make that an open house and run that Facebook Live for as long as it takes you to be able to go through that entire home, every nook and cranny, and like that's enough. You don't have to get fancy. You don't have to film or record or have to figure out anything else. It's better to do that than to do nothing because what the actual viewers will see is, wow, there's a virtual real estate professional. And that's what you want to get front of mind for people more than anything else. Yeah, such powerful stuff. So yeah, I mean, I'm curious because it's, you are a, a virtual, you know, real estate professional. So I know that you have the equipment and you have the, you know, the, the capability of pulling this off at a high level, are you, when you're doing these tours, is this something where you're having like your videographer follow you? So it's just like an open house where you physically are giving the tour, but then they're also connecting with you, or is it going to be where it's just leading with the camera where it's just like, you know, not being led to the tour. So right now they are just us um, only because we are doing everything we can to really stay home as much as possible, like follow all CDC protocols. So we are very sensitive to that. So we're really only doing vacant homes, having the agent as an individual in that home. Um, there are opportunities, I'm sure, as we continue to execute on it to maybe, you know, 
use social distancing and still be able to have the videographer in there. Um, we're not doing that today though. Yep. Love it. Love it. Powerful stuff. And then are you seeing a, a big demand or an uptake of clients wanting to also do virtual listing and buyer presentations or, or you find that they still are okay with meeting in person for those? So we are actually not providing the option to meet in person for listing or buyer presentations at this time. Um, we are really clear on the importance of everybody helping do their part and flattening the curve and like staying home. Like we really um, are doing everything possible to function virtually. So if it's a point that we've already done the virtual consultation with the seller and we need to see the house and they're moving forward with listing it, we really are even trying to just walk through the home without them there when that's at all possible. So to the fullest extent that we can maintain that we are. Um, so all of our appointments are being held virtual and our team is trained to ask people for one of two things, either a virtual coffee talk. If it's somebody who's a little bit more nurture, may have some questions, may just want the human connection, but like get the conversation face to face. Um, or for those who we are learning how to comb through our database for the people who still do need to buy and sell, and they are there, and then we're holding virtual consultations with them. Um, and the virtual consultations, I don't know if we're ever going to want them to go away, because I found that we're better presenting virtually than we are in person because of the controls that we have on our presentation and the way that we can take our buyers and sellers through showing them the virtual technology. That's a huge part of what I recommend anybody doing virtual consultations. Don't treat it like a standard meeting and say, hey, we have virtual tools and we're like happy to serve you, treat it first and foremost, put your virtual systems and models in your listing and buyer presentations, just as if it was talking about your 15 point marketing presentation. So don't make the fact that you're operating virtually different or a side piece to what you're doing day to day. Show them that you're already adapting that and that that's just part of who you are day to day in your business. Um, and then as you're going through that, show them the virtual technology. Show them what it would look like when you're walking them through a virtual tour. Show them how they can get on and favorite the listings that you provide them through whatever IDX you're using. Um, show them what it looks like from a virtual tour that you've held, beha held before. Um, different parts in which they can feel comfortable with the technology and how they'll be served through this. Uh, one of the other things inside of that is, you know, we just have instructions because a lot of people say no when you go for the ask of the virtual meeting because they're afraid of Zoom or they don't know how to get onto a video chat. So things for us that are such second nature, people are resisting only because of their lack of knowledge around it. So we acknowledge that and a couple cool things that we're using that anybody could take on is one is we have a how to Zoom meeting instruction guide that we send to everybody with really simple step by step. That's also in that Facebook page that I mentioned that I have. And we also are telling people that we have a tech concierge on the team. Now there's 12 of us and any one of us could be a tech concierge. So if Jen calls Michael and needs Michael to tech concierge Sally, he's going to do it. Yet what that does is it gives us the power to just add that layer and say, hey, if technology is not a strength for you, we actually have a tech concierge on the team who can walk you through any step of either the meeting, any document signing, any part of the virtual tours. If there's ever a part you get stuck, we're here for you. And you just make people feel safe. And by making them feel safe, they all still have the desire to meet their goals. And these real estate goals still can be achieved when you have the ability to teach people the way to achieve them. And that's what they don't know. It's the unknown that causes the barriers. Yeah, love it. And then I, I you know, I know it might be tough to track this per se, but I got to imagine when you're doing all of the virtual community block parties and so forth, they're already getting an experience with the technology, you know, develop that connection with you where it seems like it would just lead so much easier into the understanding of how the real estate process is going to work virtually because they've, they've experienced it at a level without just you having to show them. Yes. Yes, you want to experience them into all of it, whether it's right, the way you're demonstrating it socially or getting them involved, like the community pages. Um, we have different live events almost three, four times a day. So it's just more examples of ways that people can hop into the technology and adapt into what's possible for them. So then this, again, just like you said, becomes second nature.
Yeah, and then I'd have to imagine too the 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 people that choose to not move forward with buying and selling, you know, until the let's just say quarantine is uplifted. Mm-hmm. Just the fact that you they're they're seeing how proactive and quickly that you guys are adapting. Like I can't fathom them choosing to go with anybody else after I'm sure that that is going to solidify that relationship once they do feel comfortable reigning the marketplace. Cause I mean, the reality is, is 90% of real estate agents right now are burying their head in the sand and doing nothing. Yeah. Um, there's a term emotional capital that I love to use. And, and that's really what's happening right now. Those of us who are choosing to care enough about people to just even reach out and see how they're doing and then find ways that we as you know realtors we're really keepers of community and so how do we take that honor and find ways to bring connection for others and stay in front of them in appropriate methods in which you're building emotional capital Um, i'm sure we can all think of that one person who whatever the service is insurance anything that you have in your life that they just made such an impact on you that no matter what you would only work with them this is the opportunity for real estate professionals in their lifetime to build that emotional capital with their database. And one thing is for sure, you're either doing it or you're not. And if you're not, someone else is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, I had a friend ask me the other day, he's like, Hey, have any of the professionals that you do business with in your life, like your CPA, your attorney, your insurance agent, your physician and so forth. And he listed a longer list of it, but he's like, have any of them reached out to you to see how you and your family are doing during these times? I'm like, no, not one. And I get it. They're all worried about their own businesses and dealing with their own lives. And, you know, but it's such a huge opportunity for us to step up and show them that we truly care. And I mean, have you experienced, are you seeing anybody else do this kind of stuff in your community? Not a lot of people. Um, And I'm very active in our masterminds. So we have a pretty active high producer community in the Baltimore area. So I've been a part of the weekly masterminds and the conversations. And, you know, I I could confidently say maybe less than 5% of the entire community is taking on any of this. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, we we took a listing over yesterday from somebody who just I have a ton of respect for in our marketplace, and I thought that they would be even further along than some of the things that we're doing, let's say. And when I heard the conversation that they were coaching their people on to having with the client, I, it was in that moment that I just really realized how different people are handling the situation and how unique our approach is, um, and it's working. And I'm yeah. that. No, I love it. And, and, you know, it sounds like you have just for our team leaders and broker owners that are listening to, to the podcast here. Um, well, it's all obviously value for everybody as well, but uh, uh, you know, because of that virtual component, you know, it is that much harder accountability can, and maybe it's just a, a false perception, but it can, it, it, you know, it can be harder or again, this could just be a limiting belief but it's easier when people are in the office and you can see what they're doing every day versus this virtual world. And I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs that are afraid of the virtual world because of maybe that lack of accountability. Now I know accountability is something that's extremely important to you. What are things that you guys are doing? I know you talked about your two team zoom meetings a day, but how are you holding people accountable and inspecting what you expect and, you know, making sure that people just aren't chillaxing all day. (laughs) Yeah. You see me smiling. I'm having so much fun with it. I was telling myself uh, last week, I was like, I don't think I ever want to let anyone out of this quarantine. I got something going on here. Um, So we have just really, um, I have this idea of the productive virtual agent and it's the ability to be able to create schedule, right? Um, Create gamification and create the visual scoreboards around that. And through that equation, you can get productive agents virtually. And so the first thing is people just have to know what they're doing, okay? If people don't know what they're doing, they're gonna do whatever they wanna do. So as an organization, like just being really clear on what it is that your agents should be doing to remain productive is first and foremost. Anybody who assumes people know what they're doing are only hurting their opportunity for their people. So I would just say that's first and foremost. So lead by that example of schedule and 20% because the 20% is a little bit different. Um, For those of you who may not know what that is, just priorities, right? Make sure that the priorities are really aligned. 
then what we do is we have um, scoreboards and we have gamification around everything. So in my Facebook group also is a scoreboard that I shared because I was getting a ton of requests for it from my presentations over the last month. And we decided, <clears throat> excuse me, we decided the most critical elements that were non-negotiable as an organization. And the agents decided it, I didn't decide it. So it was not top down. It was a very collaborative, in order for us to think that we're going to make it to the other side of this, what do we have to do on a daily basis conversation? Um, and they established what those benchmarks were. And I created a scoreboard for them around those benchmarks. So we have some automations. And for us, it's a little bit advanced where things will check mark for you. However, there's very basic ways and you need 20 check marks a day on this and 50 check marks a day on this and five check marks a day on this. And then everything is just a scoreboard. So people can see where they are against everyone on the team at all times on a daily basis. Um, they know that it gets reviewed and looked at daily. Uh, we hold daily downloads with each agent in addition to the two time a day meetings. And we look at that scorecard for them in that meeting to help them align their priorities if their plumb line has shaken at all. Um, and then we gamify it. So um, for instance, last week, um, the winner of a hundred point competition, if anyone got a hundred points five days in a row, they got a hundred dollars. Um, another competition was the winner of a certain set of doing their activities, got a pizza dinner delivered to their family. Um, so we just create ways in which we can hold those minimum standards accountable. Like what do you agree first and foremost for yourself that you think you should be doing? I'm not going to tell you what to do. You're going to tell me what you're going to do. And then I'm going to hold you accountable to that because it's what you want. My goal in life is to help people get what they want because I know enough of that gets me what I want back. And so it's being able to have that conversation where I'm not telling people this is what you have to do until they tell me that it's what they want to do. And then I'll tell them that they have to do it in a really high energy and accountable environment that is established fully through the gamification and the transparency of the scoreboards. You have to give people easy way to track what they're doing and then you have to make it fun for them to do it. Um, you can't motivate people, you can only motivate AID. So you have to take a certain level of natural motivation in people and the desire to want to succeed. And when you have people with the desire to want to succeed, you guys can help decide what are the most appropriate actions in the now. And if we do stuff and it doesn't work, like we did one last week, then we're not doing that anymore. We're doing something different. Yet if even 50% of what we're throwing at the wall is sticking, we're doing 50%, almost 500% better than most people are doing, just trying to struggle how to function virtually. We, um, we're on Zoom hours and hours a day together, lead generating. So we just are creating as much of the environment as we did in the office at home. And that's the key to the success for us. Yeah, so powerful. So then, you know, what, what are some of the systems that you're utilizing? I mean, is it, you know, something as simple as like a, a, a Google form that they're filling yeah. out each day for the check marks that are auto-populating a Google sheet for you? Or is there another system that you're using to kind of put these together? Yeah, it's really Google Sheets. So we have everything functioning through Google Sheets, some zaps we have built in there as well. Um, so we have people check marking off what their key activities are that then feeds itself to a scoreboard and everything's just done through sheets right now to keep it really easy. Um, what we do have is we have a contact tab and the contact tab as well as the source of the contact and the type of contact it is, is what feeds some of the scoreboard. So if you put in a follow-up as the contact type, it's going to check off one of your 10 follow-ups for the day. Right. If it's a um, person who you have marked as nurture, it's going to check off one of the boxes for your five nurtures for the day. Now that's advanced. People don't have to have that to be able to make this work. Yet that's the next level. You can just start at generic check boxes and people keeping even a piece of paper writing down the results. And that is enough to hold them accountable. Um, you know, there's this idea of peeling the onion and accountability that I love to share with people. So often what we do as leaders, and I've only learned this from lots of failure, is you ask somebody if they've done something and they tell you that they have. And then because you're in a trusting and accountable relationship with these people, you want to believe it. However, even when people have the best of intentions, they don't always either understand or they may do it the way they want to do it, not the way it's designed to be done. And so I say you always have to peel the onion until there's no onion left. So just because you ask somebody if they did it doesn't mean that you take it. You ask them to show you that they did it. 
And then if they show you and they're like, okay, Jen, I'll give you an example. I made 20 calls. Awesome. Show me. Oh, I didn't put them in the sheet. I have them in my phone. Okay, no problem. Show me your phone records. Oh, right. So it's like, send me screenshots. Don't stop the questions until you can fully see every aspect of what it is you're attempting to help somebody get. If you stop at any answer that they give you that doesn't show you yourself, that you can see that that actually happened, you're doing them a disservice more than anything else. And as leaders, I think that we owe people the opportunity to see where their opportunities are. And if we don't peel the onion, we just don't see it because we're checking a box to say, oh, yep, I asked for that and that's done. And it ends up hurting us all in the end. So then what, what happens if you're peeling back that onion, but you, you f- continue to find that it's, they're just not hitting their commitments or, or so forth? You know, like what is, you know, what, what are the consequences or what does that kind of follow up look like? Yeah. Um, so I like to lead from the inside out. I know that when people are not performing to the actions that they have agreed upon or believe that they should be doing or the organization believes that they should be doing and they agree upon, I always believe that there's something going on inside with somebody that's creating that block or their barrier. Um, So initially, I really do come from a huge place of care and compassion of helping the person understand themselves, first and foremost. I think self-awareness is probably the key component that gets people to move themselves from where they may be stuck to what their possibility is. And oftentimes it's just not seeing that self-awareness enough times to create movement in the action. And so I will probably, you got me about three to five times. (laughs) So you probably have about three to five times of very, very empowering, powerful self-awareness conversations of where we may have opportunity in our behavior. Um, You know, one of the things that I think is really critical that we don't pay attention to is that people attempt to change their behavior. This actually came from Profits First. I'm not the original, but people attempt to change their behavior and behavior can change in moments, but it doesn't often change permanently. And the way to get results and actions is to build systems around your behavior. So don't wait for the behavior to change before you ever see or will agree, oh, we'll see that result when I'm not afraid of cold calling anymore. I'm afraid of cold calling. I'm going to sit with you, Jen, and I'm going to make three calls a day. And can you just hold my hand and listen to me so you can give me feedback? And then tomorrow we'll do four. And then the next day we'll do five. So we just really look at what's holding you back on the inside. How do you get the self-awareness around that? And then how do we just pick like any action? Like there's always something available. There's either always a question could be asked or an action that can be done no matter what state you're in. And so I spend most of my time helping people see what that is, taking advantage of that action or that question, and then just figuring out what we can do next when the result comes from that state, which is really that being in the now. Yeah. Love it. So powerful. And you know, I'm curious with, cause man, you, you got a lot going on, <laughs> right. And you execute fast and you implement and you're proactive. And, you know, so I, I, to get all of this done, but also be able to think creatively like you do and to be able to, to pivot and execute like you do, I have to imagine that you're, you're pretty intentional with your schedule and, and your time to get all of this stuff done. Cause you also have a life outside of real estate as well. Right. So you know, what does that look like for you? I mean, it seems like always the, the busiest people are always the most productive as well. And, you know, I mean, can you kind of walk us through maybe what your daily planning looks like or so forth to be able to get all of this in? Sure. Um, so everything with me starts on Sunday. Um, it doesn't matter if I can do it in the morning or I don't shut my eyes before 3 a.m. I do not walk into a week without like full clarity and having my schedule completely built out. Um, the process I go through for that is that by usually the end of the week prior, I have the majority of the meetings that I know are going to happen already in place. Um, and you know, people time block and time blocks become white noise. And so what I had to figure out is what was something that I could create for me and my people that when we put it there, we'd actually pay attention to it. And so I designed this idea of action blocks. And what an action block is, it's you identify what needs to get done in relation to your priorities for the week. So what I do is I look at the calendar as it's been designed with whatever got scheduled. 
I then identify my priorities for the week based in my multiple businesses, because I'm usually working inside multiple businesses on a weekly basis. And then I figure out what the action blocks are specifically that I need to achieve to complete all of those priorities and goals. And I build the rest of my calendar to be filled with all of those action blocks. So by the time we get to the end of the day Sunday, my weekly calendar looks like a combination of meetings, commitments, and action blocks. And there's no space in between. So I'm either executing or I'm in a meeting and I really work through the organization of that um, and also I'm really good at saying no when I need to so much so that I will pull things off the calendar if necessary for the action blocks of the priorities. So if Sunday comes and I had a meeting that I scheduled, but I see that I filled my action block holes already and I have more action blocks necessary, I will start to delete based on priority and reschedule people to ensure that I hit what I know has to happen in the actions on a weekly basis. And that way, I don't have any time blocks in my calendar that just become day to day, oh, there's another time, the same thing over and over. Because it's very hard to follow schedule like that for me. Um, yet when I have the action blocks built out every week that are not static, but just formulate to what's going on in life, I, I win with my time. Yeah. Love it. Powerful stuff, man. Um, so then, you know, I know that you talked about your, your Facebook group, and then it sounds like you have some consulting clients. Uh, I mean, can you kind of elaborate a little more on, on what those are? And if anybody that's listening wants to, to learn more about it, to, I don't know if the, the Facebook group is something that's open or if it's a paid group or so forth, but can you yeah. just kind of give us some more I, information I, on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the Facebook group, I actually just launched it yesterday out of all of these individuals asking for some of these resources. So that is on Facebook and it is called Thrive as a Virtual Real Estate Professional. Um, so you can find that there. You can also find me on Facebook under Jennifer Lang Schiff and on Instagram at Jen the Queen Schiff. Um, as far as my consulting company, um, the name of that business is Manifest Consulting. It is very much a referral-based business. However, if you do have any interest in learning more about how I work with my consulting and coaching clients, please just either uh, DM me or send me a message and I'd be happy to speak more with you about it. Um, the focus of that is really I work with action-oriented entrepreneurs. So the contingency to my consulting relationships is people are willing to do the things that they commit to on a weekly basis. If you're not willing to do it, I'm not your coach. And so that's a really fun time for us. And um, I'm able to help people get incredible results on the other side of it. Yeah, that's awesome. And those that are watching and listening, wherever you're at, if you just scroll below, we'll have links to all, all of that to make it super easy on you so you can connect with Jen right away with that. And so I know we're going long on time, but one last question for you. Uh, knowing everything that you know now today, you know, the Jen today could go back and have a conversation with Jen when you first entered the real estate business and give yourself two pieces of advice that you would have just massively fast forward your, your success journey that you're on. What would those two pieces of advice look like? Um, the first one would be like, don't take no for an answer and don't stop asking questions until you truly see that nothing else is possible. Um, throughout our career in either the growth of our business, um, helping the thousands of buyers and sellers that we've help transact. Um, in my consulting relationships, one of the things that I've really realized is that by asking questions, you can almost always get what you want. And so many people don't get what they want because they put up the barriers and it's always a no unless you ask. So just ask the question and be audacious. Yeah, love it. Such so powerful that stuff. What's that? Um, I said that would be one. Yep. Um, and then if I... Um, so the other one would be financial. So the other one would be profit first. So whether you are a single agent or whether you are growing a real estate business, um, it does not matter. I say GCI is nothing but a number. Um, you know, it doesn't matter because if you don't have profit, then the business is not worth your time, energy, and effort. So please, if you haven't read the book Profit First or for those entrepreneurs who are just getting started, make sure that you understand how much money you need to make to feel good about the efforts that you're putting in every day and carve your business model out to make sure that you net that income every month before you spend on anything else. When you give yourself the financial security it allows a space for you to grow in which a way that people who in this business have the hunger for money, people smell that. 
especially buyers and sellers when you're trying to get opportunities so that make sure your financial foundation is secure and at the very least you're taking your minimum standard of profit on a monthly basis so that you can really flourish and grow yeah love it love it such awesome stuff so um and and those that are watching and listening i know i end every podcast with this but information without implementation is truly just a start of delusion information is empowered it's taking that information taking massive action on it that gives you the power to create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Jen shared so many amazing pieces of advice with us today. Make sure that you take something that you learn and again, take immediate action on it. Make sure to go join her new Facebook group. Um, and again, we'll have all of Jen's contact information below so you guys can scroll down so you can connect and uh, continue to follow and learn from Jen. Also, if you have a referral for her area, what Mark, you're in, you're said Baltimore. you're in Baltimore. Yeah, Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah, the Baltimore yeah. metro area. Bring it to us. Yep. Love it. So we'll have all her contact information before, below. And Jen, I, I know how busy you are and I truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. This has been a ton of fun and a huge, huge honor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate yep, 100%. it. 100%. When thank you, you guys, you, everyone. Yeah. 100%. And, and thank you guys so much for watching and listening and we'll see you next time. Peace. Bye.